Hey guys, what's up? It's the Tominator, and today I wanted to do another training oriented video because it's been a while since I've done one of these. So we're going to be counting down some of the best staple exercises of famous pro bodybuilders. These are movements that the individual in question essentially put on the map, either inventing it himself or else single handedly serving to popularize it. And so, in no particular order, first up we've got Dorian Yates with his signature underhand barbell rows slash Yates rows. Now, it should be noted that these are, technically speaking, two different movements. Just because you row with an underhand grip doesn't necessarily make it a Yates row. Although that is how Dorian preferred to do them because it places the biceps in a mechanically stronger position. But the main thing that distinguishes a Yates row from a standard barbell row is the more upright posture. Barbell rows had been done for decades before Dorian Yates, but if you go back and watch someone like Arnold or Lee Haney performing them, you'll notice that they tend to bend over a lot more, keeping the back roughly parallel to the floor and sometimes going even lower than that. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, but it does place the lower back in a much more vulnerable position, and you can't lift as heavy doing it this way. Dorian realized that you can get just as good activation of the lats, and even the lower lats, standing at 45 degrees or more, rather than the traditional 90 degrees of his predecessors. Personally, I'm a big fan of his logic here. Having blown out my lower back not too long ago, let me tell you guys, it's no picnic. I couldn't even bend over to tie my damn shoes I was in so much pain. I thought for sure I'd slipped a disc or damaged something in my spine, but it turns out it was purely an injury to the muscle, although it still took several frustrating months to fully recover. So in any case, the lower back is not something you want to play around with, and that's why I would recommend the more upright posture of the Yates row. There's really not much benefit to going lower than 45 degrees anyway, so the risk to reward ratio just isn't worth it. As for the underhand grip, many people find that they're stronger using this as opposed to a regular overhand grip, but it's not for everyone. It does place more stress on the biceps, and Dorian actually tore his left biceps on this very exercise, which is why he later switched to the overhand grip. I'd say you really ought to try both ways and go with whatever feels most comfortable to you. Next up, we've got Arnold Schwarzenegger with standing concentration curls. Okay, so with Arnold, you probably most commonly associate him with Arnold presses, which is a modified version of a dumbbell shoulder press that he invented. And that would be an excellent choice for this list too, but personally, I think his standing concentration curl was more iconic. This is a bodybuilder's exercise through and through. It's pure isolation and totally non-functional, yet an effective way to build up the biceps muscle nonetheless. And prior to Arnold, I'm not aware of anyone doing it in this manner, but we've since seen several bodybuilders, including the likes of Jay Cutler and Phil Heath, emulate him many years later, so it's safe to say this one has stood the test of time. The standard method is of course to perform these seated on a bench, but Arnold said he could feel it better when he did them standing. And since mind-muscle connection is paramount when it comes to bodybuilding, that makes total sense. You, you gotta listen to your body and go with what feels good to you. And this one must have felt especially good to the Austrian Oak, as this is the moment in the film Pumping Iron where he famously remarks about coming in the gym, coming day and night, and comparing the physical sensation of the pump to sexual orgasm. Right, well, whatever supplements Arnold was taking back in the day, point me to them, because I've experienced some great pumps over the years, but never any that were quite that good. And while we're on the subject of old school biceps exercises, perhaps none are more fundamental than Scott curls, popularized by the original Mr. Olympia, Larry Scott. Scott curls are synonymous with preacher curls. It's the same movement, but Larry was one of the first to do them, hence the name. Unfortunately, this is the one exercise that I couldn't find any decent video footage of, so pictures will have to suffice. But anyway, he liked this exercise so much because he felt it really developed the lower portion of the biceps down by the elbow. Modern science geeks will tell you that this level of refined precision is impossible, that you physically cannot target a lower portion of a muscle. While I beg to differ and offer a little experiment to anyone who truly has an open mind and sees the value in personal experience, just try performing these the way Larry Scott advocated, fully straightening the arms at the bottom. You'll have to lighten the weight, of course, because this puts a great deal of strain on the biceps and surrounding tendons, 
but I've found that when I do this, the gap between my biceps and elbow joint appears to get smaller afterwards. Obviously, we can't change our muscle insertions, but who's to say we can't emphasize certain neglected regions of a muscle that were previously not getting properly stimulated? Just try it and see before you say it can't be done, guys. That's all I'm asking. Some people may also find that the preacher, aka Scott Curl, is useful for developing a bigger biceps peak, though I suspect this is true more so for individuals who are already genetically predisposed to having peaky biceps to begin with, guys such as Ronnie Coleman. Speaking of which, this next exercise is one where we've got to give a lot of credit to Big Ron. Now, to my knowledge, Ronnie didn't invent anything new per se, given that he tended to stick to the basics and did a lot of heavy free weight movements, but he definitely helped revitalize or alter the perception of certain exercises. The first one was walking lunges, which was traditionally thought of as kind of a sissy shaping exercise that hardcore lifters avoided, but there's nothing sissy about doing laps in a parking lot carrying 225 pounds on your back. But the exercise I'm going to focus on here is the T-bar row in the corner. While it's true that many old school bodybuilders did this exercise long before Ronnie came into prominence, just like Dorian, he helped to kind of reinvent it by standing more erect and really piling on the plates. He took what was already a heavy mass building movement and turned it up a notch into a certified monster lift. You'll see a lot of YouTube videos from various fitness experts saying that this type of form is wrong. And for the average lifter, that's probably true. But when you reach an advanced level, sometimes you need to get a little unconventional. You need to really overload the bar and do some cheat reps to shock the body into further growth. Doing it Ronnie's way allows you to lift maximum poundages, not only because of the more stable, upright posture, but also because of the limited range of motion. It also shifts some of the emphasis off of the lats and puts more onto the lower traps. But this is exactly what helped him build one of the greatest backs in history. Jay Cutler would later go on to copy Ronnie's form on these and attributes this specific movement to giving him the added upper back thickness and density he needed in order to finally knock off the eight-time champ in 2006. Kevin Lavroni is featured next with his trademark behind-the-neck shoulder press. Behind-the-neck anything, whether we're talking shoulder presses or lap pulldowns, has generally fallen out of favor because it places a lot of stress on the shoulders, particularly the delicate internal muscles of the rotator cuff, which could lead to injury. But speaking from my own experience, I've never felt uncomfortable with behind-the-neck variations, and certainly Kevin would appear to be the same. Case in point, he was pressing up to four plates on this myth machine, or nearly 400 pounds for reps on seated shoulder presses. Just a ludicrous amount of weight, especially going behind the neck, which makes it even stricter, forcing you to remain perfectly upright and not allowing the upper pecs to come into play. However, this is a movement I wouldn't recommend for most people, especially not at these extreme poundages. In fact, it's pretty much unheard of, even among the pro bodybuilding community. I've never seen anyone else go this heavy on this particular exercise, so Kevin Lavroni really was something special and one of a kind. And here's another guy who fits that mold and marches to the beat of his own drum, Kai Green. Now, I'll be blunt, Kai frustrates the hell out of me with his constant teases regarding an Olympia comeback, his nonsensical rambling pseudo-philosophy, and his sleazy social media marketing campaigns, but man, you can't deny his greatness as a bodybuilder. And you can certainly learn a lot just watching the guy work out. For instance, I bet I'm not the only one who'd never heard of Jefferson squats before Kai Green came along. Now, obviously, he didn't invent them or they'd be called Kai squats. But still, if there was one exercise that really epitomized what Kai Green is all about, it's this one. It's an unorthodox twist on an old classic. It's functional, yet awkward. And you can't help but to stare in earnest curiosity whenever this odd-looking exercise is being performed. I'll admit I never tried it out because, frankly, I think it looks a bit fruity and don't see the need. But if you compete or just want to really target the glutes, this one is probably worth a shot. And here's another unusual lower body variation courtesy of the timeless veteran Dexter Jackson. Again, as with many others on this list, I'm not sure if Dexter actually came up with this one on his own. 
It might very well be the product of his longtime trainer, Charles Glass, who's famously creative in the gym and loves to make use of machines in ways that they weren't intended. But regardless, Dexter is who I first saw performing it many years ago, and he's still the one I see doing it most often. For lack of a better term, this is the single leg twisting hack squat. You also see these sometimes performed on a leg press as well, but the idea is to really target the outer part of the quadriceps and glute areas and to isolate one leg at a time to ensure symmetrical development. Personally, I think it's a bit gimmicky and that walking lunges essentially achieve the same goal without putting the lower back in an awkward, potentially risky position. But then again, who am I to criticize the methods of one of the greatest to ever do it? Dexter's side leg specifically is one of the best ever, which is a big reason why he thrives in poses like the side chest. And to a large extent, of course, this is genetic and the result of great conditioning, but people who think you can't acquire more detail and muscular development in certain areas by strategically incorporating specific exercises really don't know much about bodybuilding. If one could obtain complete lower body development through a single exercise or two, bodybuilders would just stick to squats and leg presses and call it a day. But of course, it doesn't work like that. Different exercises and machines hit the muscle from different angles, stressing different portions of the legs, and so including a variety of exercises is key to building a champion caliber set of wheels, just as it is for any other body part. Dexter understands this, and is also smart enough to adapt his training style as he ages, relying more and more on machines in order to minimize wear and tear on his joints, which is partly how he's been able to hang around for so dang long. In contrast, someone like Ronnie Coleman, for example, never adapted, but stubbornly stuck to what he'd always done in spite of mounting injuries, and look at how that turned out for him. Okay, on a brighter note though, here's Lee Haney performing an admittedly somewhat obscure exercise he dubbed Behind the Back Upright Rows. Now, you've probably heard of Behind the Back Shrugs before, but Haney actually took it a step further by shrugging the bar up and over his butt in order to achieve a greater contraction in the traps, especially the lower portion of the traps. Of course, this gets the arms more involved and extends the range of motion, meaning you won't be able to lift as heavy as a conventional shrug behind the back, but the trade-off may be worth it. After all, it's probably not the best idea to be hoisting hundreds of pounds behind your back to begin with, as this really isn't a natural position to be lifting from. I believe it was Johnny Jackson who advocated doing behind-the-back shrugs in this manner as well. And we all know he's got some of the best traps of all time. So if you're bored of doing regular barbell and dumbbell shrugs, Maybe give this one a try next time instead. Now, as with everything else, certain ideas and practices are a product of their era. Fads come and go, and these next two examples I'm about to show you probably fit that description, but I still think they're worth a mention. The first of these is the so-called grimy curls, the invention of young Canadian bodybuilder Regan Grimes. As you can see, it's essentially just spider curls, but holding plates instead of a barbell. This changes the grip to a neutral or hammer curl position, shifting more focus onto the brachialis and also the forearm muscles of the brachioradialis. But the genius of doing it this way is you have an easy, built-in method for doing drop sets. Simply let go of a plate and continue on. The reason I'd say this exercise is kind of gimmicky in the product of its time, however, is because it's essentially just a hammer grip spider curl and it wouldn't have really been possible until recently when most gyms adopted this style of plate. In previous generations, 45-pound plates typically didn't have holes in them, so holding on to two or more at a time would have been a challenge for anyone without big show size hands, and it probably would have tested your grip strength more than anything else. But still, kudos to Regan for coming up with something new, and bonus points for giving it a catchy name to boot. Okay, and before we get to the final entry, I just want to do an honorable mention first. I didn't include this on the list proper because it's not really its own exercise, but rather a whole family of exercises all centered around a common type of equipment. And yes, we're talking about Phil Heath and his unbridled love affair with hammer strength machines. So it's no secret that hammer strength machines, you know, those plate-loaded isolateral alternatives to basic compound movements, have existed for many years. Guys like Dorian Yates and Kevin Lavroni were using them back in the 90s for sure, and they probably date back even further than that. 
And it's not exclusively hammer strength anymore either, as other equipment manufacturers have been modeled after this style now too. By gosh, have you ever seen another bodybuilder rely on them quite as much as Phil Heath did? It's almost like the dude was sponsored by hammer strength for crying out loud. And I don't know about you, but constantly witnessing the reigning Mr. Olympia, aka the top bodybuilder in the world, smash out reps on these bad boys, sort of piqued my interest. Prior to Phil, I never really paid much attention to these bulky devices, usually opting for good old-fashioned free weights. And it definitely took me a few tries to kind of get the feel for it, but once I did, it was pretty awesome. There's no denying that these machines are satisfyingly smooth and really take a lot of pressure off of the joints. I highly recommend them for any seasoned lifter out there, especially the older guys. It's probably not such a great option for the beginner, or those more concerned with functional strength, but for anyone who's already built up a solid foundation and might be getting bored of the standard bench presses and dumbbells, try giving these a shot. Okay, and finally we come to the last unusual staple exercise, and this is Branch Warren with Chain Dips. This just might be my favorite one of all, despite having never actually done it before, simply because it looks so badass. He basically took an old school exercise and instead of using a weight belt attachment, just draped a bunch of heavy chains around his neck like a boss. Not only does it look cool and inspired other cool people like The Rock to add this into his training repertoire, but it even seems to be an improvement on the original weighted dips. By shifting more of the weight to the front, this causes the torso to pitch forward more than in a regular dip, which by extension shifts more weight onto the chest and off of the triceps. I mean, think about it. Normally, if you want to target the triceps on dips, you remain more upright, whereas in other chest exercises, you're more parallel to the floor. So it logically follows then that if you make yourself more parallel to the floor in a body weight pressing movement, you're going to recruit more pecs. Not only that, but just as with Regan's grimy curls, it makes drop sets a breeze. Simply toss off one chain and keep going. Toss off a second chain and keep going. Toss the third chain to the ground and continue with body weight only. Brilliant. I'm not sure if anyone had thought to do this before Branch, but in any case, he really put this one on the map. I'd never seen or heard of anybody doing this before him. It's just a shame more gyms don't have heavy ass chains lying around so we could all try it out. All right, guys, so that's going to do it for this one. It should go without saying that this list wasn't meant to be exhaustive. I'm sure there's countless other weird and unusual exercises out there that could have been featured, but these were some of the best ones I could think of that were popularized by several of the very best bodybuilders in history. So hopefully you enjoyed. And let me know if I missed anything, and if there's enough left over, who knows, maybe we'll do a part two. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more, but until next time, this has been The Tominator, signing off, and I'll be back!